So Ebony had asked me to give an overview of our, uh, our genomic medicine portfolio. Uh, as you, you're probably aware, thank you. Um, as you're probably aware, we have uh, two major program divisions um, in, the, in the Institute, uh, the Division of Genomic Sciences, which is the Basic Science Division, and then the uh, Division of Genomic Medicine, which is the one uh, dedicated to uh, clinical applications. Uh, and within the Division of Genomic Medicine, we also have a, a number of programs that are not per se applications of uh, uh, genomic uh, approaches in clinical care. Uh, we also have a third division, Division of Genomics and Soci or Genomes and Society, uh, which is uh, um, also uh, relevant to the uh, ethical and legal social issues uh, in involved in implementation. Um, and this, there we go. Um, I'd like to start off by pointing out that when we uh, embarked on the effort to apply genomics in clinical care, this was uh, based on our strategic plan that was published in uh, February of, of 2011. Um, we also established a working group of our council, and, and many of them are here today, and here are the, the names of that group. Uh, Eric and Laura and I serve as sort of ex officio members of that group. Um, and we came up with a definition of genomic medicine because there had been a little bit of confusion, I think, in, in terms of what we were re referring to when we um, applied the term. Uh, and we use it in a fairly narrow sense as an emerging discipline that involves using genomic information about an individual in that person's care. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes on that in, involved in relating uh, genomic variation to disease. Uh, that's important work, and it's very foundational for the work that we do in applying it to individual care, but this is a, a fairly narrow de definition. Uh, one of the first things we did after establishing the working group was to call a meeting much like this one, uh, except in, uh, in the, the middle of the country. We, uh, we held it at O'Hare Airport and just invited everybody that we knew of who was doing genomics in, in clinical care uh, to come at their own expense uh, on very short notice, and, and we were delighted that uh, many of them were able to attend. Um, and from that, we identified uh, a number of common barriers, um, uh, common problems that people were encountering, and in fact, solutions that they were developing. Uh, much in isolation uh, and not really um, in, in collaboration uh, with each other. So uh, this was a, a report published from that group. Um, we, we found much more going on than we had expected. Um, and, uh, and as I noted, uh, a lot of it was going on in isolated um, um, uh, efforts. Um, since then, we have held uh, nine genomic medicine meetings. This was the first one in June of 2011. About six months later, uh, we held an effort uh, to really d begin to develop collaborations because we saw uh, the isolation as being a major problem. Um, and so that was the uh, forming collaborations in December of 2011. Uh, our th third meeting looked at stakeholders and trying to address uh, what kinds of things would be needed to in encourage payers and insurers and hospital systems to adopt genomics in clinical care. Uh, we had a fourth meeting on physician education, a fifth on working with federal partners, a uh, sixth on sort of a, a global effort, uh, very much like our first effort in, in June of 2011, uh, to really find out what was going on uh, across the world. Um, a seventh one on genomic clinical decision support, um, the, an eighth one about a year ago uh, on all of our sort of an overview of all of our programs, trying to, to identify, you know, where the holes were and, and what kinds of things we might move forward with. And one of the things we identified from that meeting was that there seemed to be a, a uh, bottleneck in bringing things learned in the clinic back into, into the laboratory and then in, in sort of encouraging that uh, free flow of information between those two groups. And so uh, our ninth meeting uh, just a few months ago uh, was focused on uh, sort of bedside back to bench. Uh, and we actually, uh, from that, um, learned that one of the important things to do was to encourage basic science uh, collaborators to be involved in meetings like this one. And so we do have uh, some of those folks here today. Um, all of these meetings, are, except the first, were video cast, much like this meeting is being video cast. Um, they're archived on our genomic medicine website, and all of the, the presentations and the meeting summaries, et cetera, are available. So if you just Google NHGRI genomic medicine, you should be able to find them. To give you an overview of, of our programs, there are six of them that we consider to be firmly in the genomic medicine space. Uh, they're arrayed here in order of sort of the, the depth of patient characterization and the breadth of, of kind of implementation strategy. So the uh, Undiagnosed Diseases Network, which actually is a, a common fund project, it's funded by all of the NIH institutes which contribute to a, a common fund, as it's called, um, but it's, it grew out of NIH's, uh, or sorry, NHGRI's uh, Undiagnosed 
Diseases Program in our intramural uh, program that was in collaboration with the Office of Rare Diseases Research. Uh, it's now expanded uh, to be a national network, and in fact, there are uh, international sites that are beginning to collaborate with them. Uh, the NSITE Newborn Sequencing Program uh, is exploring the uses of genomic sequence information in the newborn period. You can see the sizes of these programs. They vary quite a bit, uh, and the fiscal years that they've been funded. Uh, the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Program, or CSER, uh, is looking at uh, infrastructure methods and issues for integrating genomic sequence information into clinical care. Uh, Emerge is our longest standing one, uh, began as a program to use biorepositories with access to electronic medical records for genomic research. And the third phase is looking at the penetrance of uh, about 100 clinically relevant genes, and I'll, and I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail in a moment. And then we have Ignite. Uh, Ebony's going to tell you much more about Ignite, but as, as you heard from Eric, uh, the goal here is to develop and disseminate methods for incorporating um, uh, genomic medicine into clinical care, particularly in sites that, that uh, are, are not perhaps on the, on the uh, sophisticated cutting edge level of this, but much more routine care uh, that, that mostly you and, and I uh, receive. Uh, and then the ClinGen program, the Clinical Genomics Resource, uh, actually drew, grew out of our first meeting um, in, back in, uh, in Chicago, where we recognized that uh, many sites were trying to determine which variants to report um, and to whom to report them to and what actions to take on them. And again, each of them were, was reviewing the same literature, uh, largely coming up with the same conclusions. Uh, and we recognized that a central resource for doing that would be a, a useful thing. Um, and so their, their goal is to develop and disseminate consensus information on, on on these genes and variants. Um, and, and just to kind of give you, uh, we like matrices in the, in the government, so looking at a kind of a matrix view of, the, of our, our programs, kind of a right across the top, uh, and then the, the various emphases that they have, uh, you can see um, shown here as sort of the primary emphasis of these programs. The ClinGen resource is really focused on variant curation. Uh, Emerge uh, in its third phase, looking at estimating prevalence. Um, uh, CSER II is establishing, this is going into its second phase, establishing the clinical utility of uh, sequencing in clinical care. Um, Ignite is firmly in the dissemination and clinical decision support area. Um, clinical evaluation and deep phenotyping is the goal of, of the UDN, uh, and the NSAID is, is obviously focused on, on prenatal, newborn, and, and pediatric care. Uh, but each of these programs actually uh, addresses almost all of these, uh, these goals in, in varying degree, and so shown here, uh, you can see that for Ignite, for example, uh, it also is, is heavily involved in clinical evaluation and deep phenotyping typing, and you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, today, and also has uh, some lighter involvement in some of these other areas, and then you can see uh, how the others kind of line up. Um, to kind of give you an overview of each of them very, very briefly, this is the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, focus, focusing on puzzling medical cases uh, and, um, and uh, trying to come up with a diagnosis. These are uh, Dr. Bill Gall and, and Cindy Tift on rounds with a young patient, uh, and they have a whole crew of people who join them. Uh, these rounds are open to anyone uh, in, the, in the clinical center or in the, in the NIH, and they are heavily attended. Uh, and as I mentioned, this has now been opened up to a national network, so there are six other sites that are, that are uh, collaborating with um, the uh, NIH site, uh, as well as uh, several sites internationally uh, that are, are working in this area. The NSITE site program uh, comprises four different grants. You can see them here, uh, and they are uh, all relatively small focus on, on newborns, both very ill and healthy newborns, um, and looking at um, primarily the uh, newborn sc uh, screening panels and their uh, relationship to, uh, to sequencing. So how does sequencing um, uh, sort of augment or, or complement uh, what might be done in standard newborn screening panels? The CSER uh, program, uh, which has moved into its second phase or is moving, it's currently under, under review, uh, is looking at applying sequence data to clinical care, uh, including you know, su such mundane things as implementing a clinical workflow, which is very important in, in the implementation area and uh, has to be done in a variety of different ways depending on the local setting, uh, interpreting and translating data for clin clinicians and communicating findings to patients, also developing best practices for whole genome and whole exome sequencing, uh, and developing an evidence base for implementation. In its second phase, it will be moving forward uh, with these uh, uh, efforts. Uh, and you can see here the nine programs that make it up. Three of them are co-funded by um, the uh, uh, National Cancer Institute. 
uh, Emerge is, is the longest running and, and probably most complex of, of our programs to date. Um, multiple sites, as you can see, nine clinical sites, a coordinating center, two sequencing centers. Uh, and it has a, a variety of, of components. It began as a GWAS discovery um, study in, in 2007. Uh, it also involved electronic phenotyping and has, has proven through the efforts of, of many who are here in this room uh, the value of electronic phenotyping using electronic medical records. Uh, there's also a, a methodology for consent developed, community, community consultation, uh, data privacy efforts, there's a pediatrics component, pharmacogenomics component, uh, clinician and patient education is a large uh, part of it as well, and, and clinical decision support uh, in addition. So um, its uh, current aims are to continue discovery and implementation research using large uh, biorepositories linked to electronic medical records. As I mentioned, uh, it will be looking at sequencing about 100 clinically relevant genes, uh, assessing phenotypic, phenotypic implications of the variants found by leveraging the um, uh, well-validated EMR phenotypes um, and possibly recontacting and re-examining participants uh, using appropriate consent and education, reporting these variants to patients or their families and their families and clinicians, and then assessing the impact uh, not only on patients and clinicians but also on the medical care system. And then Ignite, you'll hear much more about, I just list the, uh, the goals of it here, expanding and linking existing projects, developing new collaborative projects, and contributing to the evidence base, uh, defining and sharing the less well-resourced uh, settings. Uh, and these, you'll see this map again, I'm sure, several times. Uh, these are the, the various uh, sites of Ignite. The, lastly, the Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, uh, was that, uh, is that uh, program to curate variants and provide information to clinicians as to what to report, how to report it, and what to do once you've found them. Uh, the goals here, creating a centralized resource of annotated genes and variants, um, including standardizing the assessment of variants and depositing them into ClinVar, the database of uh, clinical variation that is led by our, our partners at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, uh, developing a consensus process, curating genes and variants, uh, developing machine learning algorithms to improve uh, uh, speed and accuracy uh, and disseminating that information, exploring integration of it uh, into the electronic health records. And several of the uh, ClinGen investigators are, are at this meeting as well. Um, and one of the things that they have, have recently produced are guidelines for clinical actionability, uh, developing clear and robust cri criteria to guide these decisions uh, based on a, a variety of components, severity, likelihood of disease, efficacy of an intervention, uh, nature of the intervention, how invasive it is and the level of evidence supporting it. Uh, and this was recently published in Genetics and Medicine um, uh, with Jess, uh, Giselle Hunter, uh, Je sorry, Jessica uh, Hunter, Katrina, you'll notice, is, is here as well. So I think at that point I will stop. Um, I'd like to thank all of the program investigators, as I said, many of whom are here, uh, and particularly their research participants, uh, all, all of my colleagues at NHGRI who are working in this, and of course our uh, genomic medicine working group. Thank you very much.